My name is Michael Guyot, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Rob Arnott, who's been in business for a while and knows a thing or two about value investing. But Rob, introduce yourself to those that are here. Who are you? What's your background? How'd you get involved and interested in markets? And how much has life been challenging with value investing the last decade? <laughs> Well, I've been a lifelong value investor, and value investing has had a decade-long period of difficulty. Classic definitions of value, like if you use the Russell Value Index compared with the broad market Russell 1000, what you find is it peaked in February of 2007, went down for 13 and a half years through August of 2020, and has made a fitful recovery since then, soaring for a few months, then tanking and testing the lows, then soaring for a year, then tanking and testing the lows. So it invites the perception that value is dead. In fact, there have been some papers of almost exactly that title. But what I find just fascinating is that the entire drawdown of value relative to the market or value relative to growth can be explained by one thing, and that's value getting cheaper. Now, that sounds like a truism, but it's not. It's that value is cheaper relative to the underlying fundamentals. So if you look at price earnings ratios for value relative to growth, price to book value ratios, even things like price to sales ratios or price to dividends plus buybacks, what you find is that the value stocks of during that 13-year span got cheaper and cheaper relative to the fundamentals by a margin bigger than the performance shortfall. Now, why does that matter? Because it means that if the valuation multiples for value were the same as they were in 2007, value would have outperformed growth. So that's a kind of a shocker. This was a bear market in value stocks relative to growth, the biggest and longest bear market in history for value relative to growth. But it was not a bear market for value companies. The underlying earnings, dividends, buybacks, book value, fared just fine relative to growth. Real shocker. In, in terms of your own career progression, what got you to focus so much on the value side of the style? Well, it goes back to the beginning. I mean, I started when I was heading off to college, I was debating between a career in astrophysics <laughs> or a career in finance. And I discovered that while I was very good at math, I wasn't world-class by a long shot. And I realized that in finance, scientific method wasn't used at all. The, it was a world in which there were rules of thumb, there were casual insights, there were people looking for simplistic relationships that might have been profitable in the past. And scientific method means you, you start with a hypothesis, you test it, and you remain open-minded to the idea that, that you could be wrong so that you're always learning. And, and by the way, scientific method isn't all that common even in science. <laughs> but I realized that applying scientific method in finance would be a much more interesting career than being a second-rate astrophysicist. And so, so I continue to have a fascination with and a passion for astronomy, for science, for astrophysics, and so forth. But it's more on the level of a hobby. My career has been finance. Now, if you're using scientific method on investing, the underpinnings of the value of any company is how's it going to do in the future? And how much is it going to pay to its shareholders in the future? John Burr Williams, back in the 1930s, famously focused on the net present value of all future dividend distributions of a company as the very essence of what the company is worth. Now, you can broaden that to dividends plus buybacks plus possibility of being bought out by an acquisition partner. But be that as it may, Net present value of future profits or dividends of a business are the very essence of value investing. So I've been a value investor all my life, and value investing works. Now, what do I mean by it works? It adds value by giving you a rotation steadily into the companies that are ch trading cheap relative to their fundamentals. And so if you have a stock, 
and it soars, but its underlying fundamentals don't soar, then what you'll find is a value investor will look at that and say, this stock has gotten ahead of its fundamentals. It's time to trim that holding. If a stock tanks and its fundamentals don't, think back to the COVID crash where the narrative was there's going to be sweeping bankruptcies across the macro economy. Lots of companies are going to go bust. And by the way, the companies that are going to go bust are pretty much all on the value side of the spectrum. So watch out. Well, lo and behold, with stimulus, those sweeping bankruptcies didn't happen. And so the underlying fundamentals of value stocks hung in there and did only a little worse for a few months than the underlying fundamentals of growth stocks. So value investing works, but it can go into favor and fall out of favor. And in so doing, as it comes into favor, value becomes more richly priced or put a different way is at a a lesser discount relative to growth stocks. And that can actually be a time to pivot out of value because it's fully priced. 2007 was the last time that was the case. Or it can fall out of favor, getting cheaper and cheaper relative to the underlying fundamentals, which is exactly what happened during the dot-com bubble and exactly what happened during the value meltdown from 2018 to 2020. You know, what's interesting is that I often wonder if one of the advent of ETFs maybe changed the co-movement and way that style momentum takes place. We'll talk about how inflation impacts value, but is there anything to the idea that just the proliferation of these basket products that people trade in and out and that result in their desire to chase momentum, if that that almost creates a even more of a prolonged period of relative weakness because if momentum is happening in growth, momentum becomes kind of self-fulfilling. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I wouldn't tr- I wouldn't trace it to ETFs per se. I would trace it to indexing. Indexing Oh, 30 years ago, indexing was maybe 5% of the total assets in the market. Today, it's around 50% of the assets in mutual funds and ETFs, and probably 30% of the total assets in the market. So you've got a huge amount of money that just says, forget the idea of beating the market. I just want to match the market. And that's fair because it's a recognition that most active managers don't beat the market and you pay more for them. So I get it. Doesn't mean that active management is a waste of time. It does mean that a successful active manager really needs to have an unsuccessful active manager on the other side of their trades. And you got to choose the successful active manager. So I get it why people put money into index funds. Index funds, by their very nature, if you move a billion dollars from non-indexed assets, from the broad market, to an index fund. You're going to sell everything you own in stocks that aren't members of the index and use that to top up holdings and members of the index. So that creates buying pressure for members, selling pressure for non-members. And it's really interesting to note that has driven a wedge in relative valuation between members of the index and non-members. So we're actually working on a paper stealing a line from American Express, membership has its privileges, in which we show that the relative cheapness or relative valuation multiples of members of the S&P 500 or the Russell 1000 30 years ago were the same as the non-members. Now it's a 30 to 40% premium. So Admittedly, the non-members are all much smaller companies and less liquid and so forth. So arguably should be trading at a discounted multiple. But should it be 30 to 40% discount? Not so sure. And that wedge in relative valuation creates a wedge in future performance. Because if you pay less for a stock, then its future profit distributions create a higher return for you. And so membership has its privileges. Being a member of the S&P 500 or the Russell 1000 or both creates a valuation premium and dropping the stock from the index creates a nosedive in valuation and a cheaper stock and therefore higher forward-looking returns than before the stock was dropped. 
So th- th- there's interesting nuances, but you put your finger on one of the main factors that likely played a significant role in value underperforming over the last 15 years or so, which does invite the question, are those flows going to stop? No, they're not. Movement of money into index funds is not going to stop. So does that mean that this will continue to be a headwind for value? That's a little bit more nuanced. The knee-jerk reaction would be, well, yeah, this is still going to be a headwind. But at some point, that relative valuation differential, 30 to 40% discount for non-members versus members, translates into higher returns in the future for those non-members. And that can offset the impact of flow of capital out of some of those stocks into the cap-weighted indexes. So it's a really nuanced question. It's, it's way more subtle than it sounds. It's also one that I think would almost be self-correcting. So I, I noted that you know, if you look at the NASDAQ 100, you know, in 2013, the top 10 stocks made up 49%. You know, if you look at the Q ETF as a proxy, Whereas, you know, 10 years later now, those, you know, the top 10 holies make up 60%. Yeah. So and of the, course, the, of course, Q is responding to that by rebalancing those holdings to less than cap weight, which is itself very interesting. SEC doesn't allow you to call yourself a diversified portfolio if stocks that are more than 5% of the weight in the portfolio add up to more than, I think, 40% of the portfolio. So that means 100 stock NASDAQ portfolio cap weighted is not a diversified portfolio. In fact, the S&P 500 is at risk of, under SEC rules, not being considered a diversified portfolio. Can you imagine that S&P 500 isn't a diversified portfolio? Well, but that, that, that's my point. It's like, you know, it's like a, I've asked that question to financial advisors I talk to you know, daily. It's like, at what point are you not fulfilling your fiduciary duty because you're in something that is claiming to be diversified, but in reality is just a concentrated idiosyncratic basket? Yeah. And um, the simple fact is, if ETFs and mutual funds want to hew to the SEC definition of a diversified portfolio, which is by itself is inherently entirely arbitrary, it's just a rule, then who the heck is going to be overweight, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple? Because the cap-weighted index isn't going to buy more and may be under pressure to trim those holdings below cap weight if they want to stay on the good side of the diversified portfolio rule. Q's already made the decision to move away. And so if the broad index funds that are designed to match the market, if those index funds underweight the largest holdings in the market, somebody's overweight those. And that invites the, the question, okay, who's overweight those stocks? You can't make a bet that Apple is too cheap or that Amazon's growth prospects are greater than the market thinks they are. You can't make that bet without falling afoul of the SEC diversified portfolio rule. Yeah, which is just a fascinating d- dynamic that we're in now. How much of this is sector-based? And I always go back to when I think about value versus growth, I think it's more just in terms of the mix of sectors. And that's arguably why even emerging markets, you can argue, have not done all that well, because most of the emerging market indices and funds are tilted towards financials, materials, energy. Right. Uh, right. Which are, which you see is kind of the value sector. So how, how exactly. much is the sector attribution versus the fundamental attribution? Well, sector attribution certainly is a big part of it. We've seen a stupendous decade for tech companies. During the dot-com era, it was tech and telecom. This go-around, it's tech and companies where the competitive advantage is tech. I mean, Amazon's a retailer, but come on, it's a tech company. And so this has been kind of a repeat of the tech bubble, the dot-com bubble of 2000, where the relative valuation multiples of the in-favor stocks are five to ten times that of the value stocks, just an enormous spread in relative valuation. And the consequence of that is that technology is a much smaller part of the macro economy than than it is a share of the stock market. So the stock market is betting that technology will be two or three times as big a share of the future economy than it is today. And I think the market is wrong about that. 
But um, be that as it may, that's what the market is telling us. Now, one of the things we did back in 2004, we were the folks who invented the Fundamental Index, or RAFI, Research Affiliates Fundamental Index, which chooses, let's say, the 500 or 1,000 largest businesses in the macro economy and then weights them by how big their business is. So NVIDIA is trillion dollars of market cap. It's leading the charge on AI. If AI takes over the world, And if NVIDIA is still the dominant company in the AI arena, then quite possibly the stock will turn out to have been worth the trillion dollars that it currently commands, and then some. But that's what the market is betting. And if the market is betting wrong, that is to say, if other companies emerge to be dominant in AI, just like Google was an upstart in search engines, and Microsoft was an upstart in spreadsheets and word processing software. To the extent that new entries become dominant players pushing aside the early companies, these companies can turn out to have not been worth the current price. There's a couple of academics, Brad Cornell and Aswath Damodaran, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, who coined the concept of big market illusion. And big market illusion is when you have a new shiny thing that everybody adores, could be electric vehicles, could be dot-com companies, it could be AI, and the market is so enthralled by the concept that it bids up everyone who's got a toehold in that business to levels that tacitly assume that they're all going to be winners. And just common sense says, no, they're competing against one another. They're not all going to be winners. So as an example of that, we wrote a paper back in early 2021 declaring electric vehicles the newest big market delusion. And we pointed out that there were eight electric vehicle manufacturers. They produced about, best of my recollection, 3% of the cars in the world. And they were worth just under the value of all manufacturers of non-electric cars combined. And of course, those manufacturers also make electric cars. Toyota was making both. But it would fall in the non-EV camp because it wasn't an EV specialist. We said this looks like big market delusion, and it was fascinating. When we wrote that paper, Tesla was priced at over 20 times annual sales, just a huge multiple. P.E. ratios of 20 are interesting. P.E. price-to-sales ratios of 20 require unbelievable growth to justify those valuation multiples. Well, out of the then eight, now 30, EV specialist manufacturers who only make EVs, of those eight, Tesla was the second cheapest, second cheapest in terms of price to sales ratio. Just astonishing. We took a, we went back and took another look at that about, oh, six or eight months ago and found that those eight companies, every single one of them had underperformed the market. No exceptions. And the performance was in direct relationship to the price-to-sales ratio. The higher the price-to-sales ratio, the worse the performance. Practically a linear relationship with perfect rank order. So it was, they ranged from 20% under the market to 98% under the market, meaning losing 98% of their value. So you can get fads. And back to your question about sectors. One of the beauties of fundamental index is that it weights the sectors according to how big they are in the macro economy. It doesn't chase bubbles. It doesn't chase fads. It will underweight all of the fads. It will underweight all of the stocks that are trading at premium multiples because you're weighting the stocks based on how big their business is. And those companies trading at premium multiples, they are better companies. They have more interesting products. They have often better management, better strategies, better finger on the pulse of the future, where the value companies often don't. But what's interesting is a narrative, 
that says these companies are the future, these companies aren't, usually has two attributes. One, it's usually partly or mostly true. Is AI going to change the world in a fundamental and revolutionary way? Yes, absolutely. The other attribute of those valuation of those narratives is that they're already in the share price. You're already prepaying for it as if that's a fait accompli, as if it's going to assuredly happen. So those growth stocks collectively to win by focusing on the growth stocks, the growth has to exceed the lofty expectations that are already baked into the share price. The value stocks, in order to hurt you, would have to underperform bleak expectations. So all value has to do to win is to perform as a business a little better than the bleak expectations baked into share prices. All growth stocks have to do to hurt you is to grow less impressively than is already baked into the share price. Beautiful example from the dot-com bubble is Cisco. For about a nanosecond, it was the largest market cap stock in, on the planet at 180 times earnings. And how's it done since then? So the market was expecting Cisco would be a huge part of the global economy for decades ahead, would see stupendous growth. How's it done? The sales and profits of Cisco have grown by 12 to 14% per annum for 23 years. That's terrific. 12 to 14% growth per annum for 23 years. You're doubling every five and a half years. That's awesome. And yet, the share price is lower than it was in the year 2000. Meaning that in the, at the peak of the dot-com bubble, people are expecting Cisco to have the kind of growth that it's had compressed into maybe eight or 10 years. And that didn't happen. So Cisco hurt you badly, even though the narrative was correct. The narrative was over-optimistic on the timeline. I think the same thing will hold true for AI. AI is going, anyone who hasn't played around with chat GPT or Dolly or any of the other popular tools that are out there, you're missing an opportunity to have some fun. It's very cool software and often shockingly good at things that you would think you'd need a human brain to do well. And so, yes, AI is going to change the world fundamentally in enormous ways. Just like dot-com in 2000 was destined and was correctly predicted to change the world in enormously in fundamental ways. The thing in the dot-com bubble was that it happened slower than the market expected. The thing that I'm highly confident is going to happen with AI is that its influence on the world will be will happen slower. But do I think it's going to reshape the world we live in fundamental ways? Do I think it will cost millions and millions of people their jobs? Yeah. Now, you're not going to lose your job to AI. It's not going to be an AI app that suddenly has your job. It's going to be someone who knows how to use AI to do your job and can do your job on one-tenth the effort that you're currently investing that would take your job. So my wife and I were on a trip to Europe a few weeks ago, and I played the thought experiment. Everyone I met during the trip, I asked myself, is this person still going to have a job in five years? Person who drove us to the hotel five years from now? Probably yes, but maybe not. Maybe AI will be driving the cars by then. Person who greeted us at the reception desk? No, she's not at risk. A person who helped us with our bags up to the room? Nope, not at risk. And if you play that thought experiment, you'll find that 80%, maybe 90% of the jobs that are out there are not at risk. They're going to be just fine, which means the AI revolution is going to happen slower, but eventually will be just as big as people think it is. Just like the internet turned out to be just as big as people thought it would be. We had the room for the remaining fans here. Everybody, please make sure you follow Rob or not on the research affiliate Twitter handle. If any of you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom of my request button. And as always, this will be a podcast on all of your favorite platforms under lead lag live. Let's go to my friend and colleague. <laughs> 
The term smart beta? We took the idea to a consulting firm called Towers Watson, which was at the time, and I think still is, the utterly dominant investment consulting firm in the UK. You can't get hired by a pension fund in the UK without the blessings of a consultant. And Towers Watson is the gatekeeper for more assets than anyone else in the UK. Well, Towers Watson loved the Rafi concept. They thought, this is cool. This is a value-tilted strategy, but it's more than that. It's an index that weights stocks in proportion to their macroeconomic footprint. So now you have indexing that studiously mirrors the look and composition of the market, capitalated indexing, and indexing that studiously mirrors the look and composition of the macroeconomy, RAFI. And RAFI doesn't, the target weight that's invested in NVIDIA doesn't follow the share price. If the share price goes up and the underlying fundamentals go up, then yeah, the RAFI weight goes up. But if the share price goes up and the size of the business doesn't, Rafi will say, thank you for that higher price. Let me trim my holding. And if a company tanks and its underlying fundamentals don't, Rafi will say, thank you for that lower price. I'm going to top that holding back up to its economic footprint, which means you get a rebalancing alpha in addition to the value tilt. So they loved the idea. What they did not want to do was to go out to the, their vast clientele in the UK and say, buy Rafi. So they they realized that the profit engine for Rafi was a really incredibly simple one, namely that we don't anchor the weight to the price. So with price weighting or cap weighting, if the price goes up, the size of your investment goes up. Now, why would you want to own more of a stock after it doubles than before it doubled? With Rafi, the weight goes up only if the size of the business goes up. So they loved that idea. They said, we think there's a new category of investing. They coined the expression smart beta. They said smart beta is investing in a fashion that doesn't let the price drive the size of our investment. And there's lots of strategies that do that. Low volatility strategies, optimization-based strategies that don't anchor on cap weight. The list goes on and on. So they said, we think this is smart beta. And they didn't think that cap weighting was stupid beta. Bill Sharp took great issue with the concept, with the label smart beta, because, well, firstly, he invented the term beta, and he thought it was a ripoff to use the term beta and say it's smart or stupid. But he also thought that the implication was that cap-weighted indexing, which is sort of, he laid the foundation for cap-weighted indexing. He found it offensive to think that his baby was stupid beta, but they didn't label it stupid beta. They labeled it bulk beta. And you can buy beta in bulk or you can buy beta smart. And they basically told their clients, you should do both. Schwab, in their model portfolios, do both. They put half in cap-weighted index and half in fundamental index. It's a very cool idea. So apropos of your earlier question on sectors, the sector allocation of RAFI moves very slowly. If you drew a graph of the sector allocation of RAFI, you'd find 6% was in tech stocks back in 1960 and 9% by the year 2000 and about 13% today. Well, that's a steady progression reflecting the fact that technology is playing a bigger and bigger role in the economy, but it doesn't pogo around wildly. It doesn't hit a peak of 30% in the year 2000 and a trough of 10% in 2007. And another peak north of 25% today. It just is a steady eddy. Here's the size of the business in the macro economy. And let's contra trade against the market's constantly changing opinion. If the market opinion of the value of a company or a sector goes up, down, and sideways, why not contra trade against that and turn that volatility into alpha? And that's what it does. We came out with a paper recently called Rafi Rocks, which took a look at the history of Rafi. Rafi fell out of favor during the 2010s, not because it wasn't working, but because it wasn't beating the market. 
that's a distinction that sounds like a, a fudge, but it's not. But by the way, but does, I was not going to interrupt, but I will say that that's, I'm so glad you mentioned that because this is where when you're in the ETF or fundraising business with mutual fund ETF, whatever it be, like that's the bogey and that's the problem if you're trying to build something that you know has real historical merit, but you happen to launch in a cycle where it's all about, you know, the passive S&P type of products. It's not that it's not working, it's that it's not working for a moment in time and then you have a business decision to make. Yeah. And if you look back at Rafi, just the passive index itself and compare it with the cap weighted indexes, what you find is it has a value tilt. It has rebalancing alpha, contra trading against the market's constantly changing opinions. And that rebalancing alpha is astoundingly persistent. So we wrote the paper Rafi Rocks. Drawing attention to the fact that if you recognize it's got a stark value tilt, why don't we compare it with the value indexes? Russell value, MSCI, equivalue, that sort of thing. And if you do that, what you find is that Rathi outperforms by about 2% a year per compounded per annum all over the world against the conventional value indexes. So early critics said, this is just a warmed over, clever repackaging of value investing. All right, if you want to say that, then why not compare it with value indexes? And lo and behold, it is, I think, the best suite of strategies in the world measured relative to value indexes. We find that for the U.S. against Russell 1000 value, there's not a single two-year span where Rathi underperforms the value index. Not one. There's not a single span of any length where peak to trough, Rafi underperforms value by more than 3%, peak to trough. And during the last, oh, let's just go back the last 16 years, for instance, the period of time that's been rough for value. During that 16 years, Rafi has beat Russell value by 50 percentage points. You'd be 50% richer with Rafi than with Russell value. That make, means you're a little richer than with Russell 1000. So you had best of both worlds. You beat the market and had a value tilt, which I think will pay off handily in the coming decade. That 50% in 16 years works out to well over 2% per annum compounded. That's a huge margin of victory. And that's what Rafi does. I think it's the best value strategy in the world. And it's because it's so simple. All you're doing is weighting companies by how big they are. If the market wants to make a bigger and bigger bet on a particular stock, you're going to contra trade against that and say, well, fine, give me a bigger discount. I'll buy more. Take it ahead of its fundamentals. I'll trim it. And that rebalancing alpha is just overwhelming. I think people tend to think of things in terms of if this, then that, right? In terms of just simplicity. Let's talk about the interaction of value style coming in and out of favor based on interest rates with the nuance that it depends on the yield curve, whether you're having a negative real rate or not, and all kinds of other things as it relates to the term structure. What have you seen in terms of, you know, the interaction of value versus growth depending upon interest rates and those different, you know, various sure. Well, there's a narrative on Wall Street that, that low interest rates are great for growth stocks because you're discounting future growth of the business at a lower and lower rate, which means it has higher and higher future value. And it helps the growth stocks far more than the value stocks where the future profits of the business are more front end loaded. They're right here right now and not necessarily growing in the future. That narrative makes intuitive sense, but it overlooks something fundamental. There's something called the Gordon equation, which is the value of a stock is it's is Basically, it's growth rate divided by one minus the discount rate. And if interest, if the discount rate is linked to growth, which it is, then the relationship with interest rates becomes much more tenuous. Cliff Asnes did an interesting paper in which he showed that that linkage is weak. We did a paper not long ago in which we showed that the link between inflation and the relative performance of growth and value is powerful. 
it's partly because inflation drives interest rates. And it's partly because there is no such thing as a period of stable high inflation. The last 30 years, we spent well over half of our time, I think closer to two thirds of our time, somewhere between 1% and 3% trailing one year inflation. So steady eddy, 2% over the last 30 years, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. Outliers below one and above three were few and far between. So we had just had elevated inflation that clipped 9% at its peak. Let's hypothesize a world in which inflation is 7% to 9%, same tightness of range, plus or minus one, two-thirds of the time over the next 30 years. Is that possible? Come on. If you have 7 to 9% inflation, it's going to be pogoing wildly. It'll hit 12. It'll hit 4. The inflation that hit 9 a year ago clipped just under 3% this past month. Does that mean inflation's over? Maybe, but I doubt it. The uncertainty associated with the inflation is, in and of itself, a source of risk. And that source of risk makes people value the underpinnings of the value of a company. Steady earnings, steady dividend distributions, steady valuation multiples. The marketplace will value those more highly during a period of uncertainty and will value speculations about long-term future growth less during periods of elevated inflation. So I would argue that the tanking of inflation this year to date has been a, a big driver of the growth surge. What are we expecting over the second half of the year? Astonishingly, most people haven't noticed that inflation fell from six and a half at the end of the year to just under three at the end of June, partly because inflation during the first half of the year was moderate and partly because those months were replacing lofty inflation. The six and a half percent inflation last year, just in round terms, was 6% in the first half of the year and half a percent in the second half of the year. So you were replacing 1% inflation months with an average of about 0.4 per month this year. Well, 0.4 per month is not 3% inflation. It's 5% inflation. And so the second half of the year, if we continue to chug along at 0.4 a month, we're going to see inflation rebound from 3% to 5%. So people are popping champagne corks over inflation tumbling to 3% when it's in large measure an illusion. It's an illusion on the back of replacing lofty inflation with moderate inflation. Second half of the year will be replacing negligible inflation with whatever comes. So if we have steady eddy moderate inflation second half of the year, we're going to see, have the illusion that inflation is soaring from three to 5% and the champagne will be put away and people will putting their, be putting their hard hats back on. So my expectation is inflation will create an illusion of soaring inflation between now and year end. It's going to have people uneasy. And that means, among other things, that value will come back big time in the second half of the year. Time will tell if I'm right. I rarely make forecasts over a time horizon as six months, but this is one that I would happily make. Okay, so how would that play into Powell hiking rates and then ongoing risks of another regional bank repeat dynamic? Again, yeah, they backstopped it you know, in March as it was playing out, but you know, there is a halo effect in terms of financial sector optimism and value style reallocation. Well, firstly, don't get me started on Powell. I've never seen a Fed chair so far behind the curve. He declared inflation transitory in March of 2021. What was inflation doing at the time? It was 4%. It had just soared from zero to four. And half of that inflation had happened in three months. So you were actually at a run rate of eight. And he says this is going to be transitory. Uh, I was appalled. Eight months later, he declares that transitory is a term that should be retired. Eight months after that, inflation hit its peak of 9.1. Thought experiment for your audience. When inflation was at 9.1, what was the Fed funds rate? Give you a second. It was 1.2%. It had only gone up 1% 
by the time inflation had gone up 9%. Talk about behind the curve. So he did scrambling catch-up second half of 2022. And that's, I'll talk about behind the curve. The other problem I have with Fed policy is they claim to be data dependent, but the data that they focus on is whatever's got their attention in any particular month. The data that matters... I mean, they, they suffer from recency bias, just like everybody else. Absolutely. Right. The data that matters most is what the market tells them is the fair price for default risk-free government debt. That market price is the consensus view of millions of investors. It's not the hunch of a dozen wise Fed governors. And so what is that market price? It's the yield on long bonds. So if the yield on long bonds is four, the marketplace is basically telling us that that's the right price for long-term government debt. Tacitly, that means that the expected long-term inflation is not nine, it's not six, it's closer to three, which leaves you room for a 1% real yield. If the Fed looked at that, they would never have taken rates to zero. They would not dream of taking rates to five, six, or 7% and thereby create a recession. Cam Harvey, I don't know if you've interviewed him in the past or not, he's the guy who discovered back in 1986 that yield curve inversion predicts recessions. I think that's actually not quite correct. I think yield curve inversion creates recessions. So now we have a pretty pronounced yield curve inversion, and that means that monetary policy is trying to crush demand in the economy in order to crush inflation. Inflation is just a matter of supply-demand mismatch. If supply is accelerating, is, is excuse me, if there are supply chain disruptions and supply is problematical and demand is accelerating, you're going to have inflation. So the Fed can't control supply, but they can influence demand. So let's crush demand and rein in inflation that way. It's a little like the Vietnam War colonel who famously said we had to destroy the village in order to save it. We have to destroy the economy in order to save it. No, the right answer is unleash the creativity of the private sector, lightly regulate business so that businesses can't prosper by crushing other businesses in ways other than having superior product. Superior product is a perfectly good basis for crushing other businesses. And then let the private sector create the products of the future. If supply is then allowed to grow to match demand, then the inflation goes away. But the Fed can't do that. So they crush demand in order to eliminate inflation. It's got a long lead time. It's very sluggish. And the impact on the economy is nearer term. So I think it's high odds we see a recession next year. I don't think it necessarily will be a horrible recession, but I think we see a recession next year. And I think it will be yet another black eye for the Fed. Although, in truth, it's not a black eye in the sense that they want it. They want to create a recession. Good Lord, why would you want to do that? Maybe just for the remaining few minutes here, Rob, and again, everybody, please make sure you follow the Research Affiliates handle here. Given that you've done this for a long time, you've talked to all kinds of smart money and dumb money, and I find that more money is dumb than smart. What do you think people get most wrong about value investing? Value investing is inherently uncomfortable. You're buying what's out of favor and unloved. If it fails, their intuitive reaction is, well, of course it was going to fail. It was a lousy business. If it succeeds, the reaction will be, well, that was a surprise. Lousy business, but it came back into favor. Growth investing is vastly more comfortable. So I think. My, I think the biggest mistake investors make is performance chasing. Anything that's newly cheap got there by inflicting pain and losses. And that means the value investor has to say, ouch, that hurt. Now, do I like it better at this price than I did before? 
reciprocally, anything that's newly expensive got there by creating great joy and great profit. And we, as human beings, we are exquisitely attuned to recent experience and avoiding recent pain and pursuing recent sources of delight. So growth stocks, if they've soared and their fundamentals haven't, the growth investor will say, yeah, but it's going to soar in the future. And they might be right, but it's in the price. They prepaid for it already. And so the value investor will look at that and say, you know, that stock's gotten ahead of itself. Let's, let's trim it, our holdings, or even get out. The value index gets out. Rafi doesn't get out. It just trims it. So value investing means buying more of what has inflicted pain and losses and trimming our holdings and whatever's created the best joy and profit. It's inherently uncomfortable, but performance chasing is the number one error investors make. The past performance is the past. And the presumption that what's done well in the past will do well in the future is self-evidently delusional, and yet it goes hand in hand with human nature. Our ancestors on the African Veld did not survive by running towards lions, and that's baked into the human persona. Absolutely love it. Rob, for those that want to track more of your work, where would you point them? You can go to at RA underscore insights or go to researchaffiliates.com, the website. We have some interactive tools that are really powerful. One of the most popular is Asset Allocation Interactive. If you Google Asset Allocation Interactive, just those words, the first non-sponsored ad will take you straight to our interactive asset allocation tool, which looks at 130 markets around the world, projects their forward-looking returns. Our industry is obsessed with past returns. Forward-looking returns are way more important, self-evidently so. So we look at the yield, the growth rates, and the forward-looking possibilities of rising valuation multiples or falling valuation multiples. What would it take for mean reversion to happen? And out of that, we come away with forward-looking expected returns for 130 different asset classes on a five to 10-year horizon. So this is not a tool for predicting next year, but it's certainly a powerful tool for suggesting where you ought to be thinking about averaging into larger holdings or beginning to trim your holdings. Thank you for joining. I know we had some tough competition with Powell but again, this will be a podcast of our Lead Lag Live. Thank you, Rob. Really do appreciate it. I always, I've always been, a, like I said, a fan of yours from the from like 10 plus years ago. And I think you, you brought up a lot of really interesting points here. So thank, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you, everybody. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Cheers, Rob. Thanks.